Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Redman TV and rather an impromptu chat with American journalist Kyle Bonner for Sporting News. Kyle, mate, how are you doing? You okay? Yeah, doing all right. A uh, little tired, but uh, on our way home. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're on your way home finally. Um, yeah, we touched base. I reached out about an hour ago now, something like that. Um, you were still inside the stadium at the time I messaged you initially. Um, you've been in the game for Colombia against Uruguay. Colombia obviously prevailing 1-0 to reach the Copa America final. That's not really the story here anymore, though, unfortunately. Um, from a Liverpool point of view, Darwin Nunes was heavily involved in the scenes and the events there after, it's fair to say. Um yeah, before we get into all that, though, Kyle, just on the game itself, not in terms of sort of the action, but in terms of the the, the feeling in the round, the stands in the round, the stadium, did you get any sense, any signs of trouble whatsoever? Did you feel like it was not being policed properly, not enough security, anything like that at all? No, not at all. And and I think, you know, the, I, I don't, I want to say up front, I, I don't have any like official information on this, but from hmm. what I'm understanding, from what players are saying and and what fans on social media are saying, it it really looks like the the impetus for this was that at the end of the match, Uruguay players came over, obviously right at the final whistle, highly emotional. They went forty five minutes up a man, couldn't score, um, you know, eliminated right at the doorstep of the final, and they went to go get their fan their uh, family from the stands and something happened that made players fear for the safety of their family in some capacity. I don't know what, I don't know if Columbia fans said something or threatened anything or, or got violent. I don't know, but whatever it was, there was family involved. There's a famous incident here in the U S years and years ago in the NBA. Um, I don't know how familiar UK fans will be with it that was affectionately known as the malice in the palace ron artest went into the stands of a basketball arena to confront a fan in in that situation a fan was chirping he was he was basically as you guys would say sledging ron artest and uh ron was not too happy about that jumped into the stands uh over a bunch of rows of seats and and started throwing punches this was not that there was family involved so I don't think there was really any feeling about that before the incident. I will say it was like at least 80% Columbia fans there. Uruguayans probably felt heavily outnumbered. And I wonder if that maybe contributed to some of this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I can imagine it would do because it's quite a daunting proposition, really. Especially when you consider... It's quite, the, the colours are very stark. I know it's a very simplistic thing to say, but it's very noticeable when you are so heavily outnumbered, 80 to 20, as you touched upon. And especially, this seems silly, but especially when Colombia's colour is yellow, yeah. it just stands out, you yeah. know? 100%. It was similar. We obviously watched England against uh, the Netherlands last night, and that's a similar sort of contrast with the orange. But again, very simplistic viewpoint on it. Um, just in terms of how it unfolded there after then, you mentioned sort of what could or could not have led to the, the the scenes thereafter. But in terms of how that all played out, you obviously understand. I've seen some of your footage from it on social media. We've actually reused it ourselves on our own channel. And um, what 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 did it look like, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And and how dramatic was it? Because it looked very it it looked like a mess. I mean that's the best way I can describe it is it was a mess. And and what's scary about it is when you have that large of a number of fans in such a close proximity, um, you, it's it's scary in the sense that you don't know. You you wonder how it's possible to break something like that up, right? Because it can just start to escalate where you know large numbers of people in such a close confined space just start to descend on each other, and. You worry about it because, especially when alcohol is involved, but even when it's not, fans just like, we always talk about players like seeing the red mist, right? Uh, fans get starstruck. You see you see the videos of like fans with, when, when they see Lionel Messi, right? And, and they like lose their minds, go knocking on his car window. 
fans do really stupid things when they're confronted with an idol of theirs right in front of them. And I think that probably contributed to this. And you just see this like mass of people moving through the stands. And my first thought was like, how is anyone possibly going to break this up? You could have all the security guards in the world. 20 security guards in one area is going to have no effect on a group of a hundred people just moving through the stands like a blob. So um, I think that's why it took so long to sort out is just, there's no sheer numbers of security guards to sort that out. No, absolutely. How did it sort of come to its conclusion in the end? They make you right, by the way, on your sort of assessment of it. That tribalism combined with the fact that there's literally footballers in the stand is a perfect storm, really, for what unfolded. But how did it sort of come to a conclusion? Was it sheer masses of numbers in terms of police and security in the end that managed to calm it down? Did players retreat? What was it? I think it was just a combination of people coming to their senses eventually. It seemed like uh, for better or for worse, the players, um, by coming into the stands, took the brunt of the attention, which I guess maybe uh, took the attention off of their families and allowed their families to either find safety or just get some space. Um, and then, you know, when, when the players, I, I'm speculating completely here, but when the players then see their families then sort of out of danger, maybe that brought them back to earth. Mm -hmm. But it took a while. Um, and there were a number of pockets of incidents. Like there was one on the field between the players. There was a couple of incidents in the stands. Um, it just really got out of hand. And and it's it's a bummer that this was the story because uh, uh, behind the curtain as a journalist for a moment, I had something all written up about how brilliant Hamas Rodriguez has been in this tournament. And of course, then this happens and it's like, well, there goes my story. No one cares about that anymore, right? So, so <laughs> That's the biggest um, travesty. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I think there's going to be, unfortunately, a, a big fallout from this. I mean, the only real frame of reference that we have or the first real frame of reference that everybody thinks about is the Eric Cantona situation, right? Because he drop kicks one fan and gets what nine months was it that he was banned for? So I, I have no idea how this is going to play out. Um, there, there's a lot of factors at play here. The idea that family's involved, there might be some leeway. Um, just the idea of fan culture in South America, them being somewhat used to violence might play into this. I don't know, but we'll see if FIFA gets involved or if um, the ball just handles it themselves. I have no idea what the fallout will be at the club level for these players, but uh, it could have a, 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 a real knock-on effect. Yeah, there's definitely potentially large-reaching implications here, obviously from Liverpool point of view as well, with Darwin Nunes' involvement. Um, you mentioned the families being involved. I think there's been reports about Manu Ugarte's mother being sort of involved heavily in it as well. We've seen Darwin Nunes sort of hugging his son there after apparently his family was passed down. We're not going to speculate too much in terms of the details in the round that, but I did notice, um, Kyle, you were in the mix zone after the game for quite a long period of time. Wait, did anybody actually come through in the end? I mean, was anything said? I I had to leave before anybody came through. We waited there for a good 90 minutes and no one came through. Um, I don't know why, but my best guess would be a combination of sorting out disciplinary matters, uh, allowing players to calm down, allowing fans to leave the area before players make any attempt to to exit the premises. I'm sure a combination of all those factors and maybe some other things. I do know that um, when I was uh, in the mixed zone for the aftermath of USA Panama earlier in the group stage of this tournament, Tim Weah was given a red card, and we were told that Tim Weah, by rule, was not allowed to come through the mixed zone because he had gotten a red card. So I wonder if there was any immediate disciplinary measures handed out that like those players may not have even been allowed to come out. Um, I haven't had any contact with the journalists that I know who were in the mix zone and, and may have stayed. Um, but I, I had timing purposes. I had to go and, and file some other stories and, and make this drive home. So I couldn't stay, but it was, I mean, you know, 
there's usually a good amount of time, like between the, the managers doing their press conferences and then doing the team talk and the players showering and, and coming out. Like there's usually a good amount of time, but we waited a while. And it's weird that not a single player came out. Like usually it's a long, slow trickle of players and you'll see guys that didn't play in the game will come out early. Nobody came out. Yeah, that is odd. Like you say, I mean, 90 minutes alone without without anybody being through is just bizarre. I've been in a couple of mix zones down the years, and that feels like a, a long goal pit. You know something's not right when that's happened, basically, let's put it that way. Um, just, Don, you mentioned Comma Ball a moment ago, and essentially them dealing with the situation, or it could escalate higher than that, of course it could. They have released a statement in sort of the immediate aftermath. I mean, how much or how little that statement says um, will sort of leave up for interpretation, but have you read it and what do you make of it? Yeah, I mean, it says nothing. You can pretty much uh tell that from first glance I, i'm honestly surprised like it says so little that i'm surprised um there wasn't even a hey we're sorting it out um you know we condemn they they like they said we condemn violence of any kind in football like they they didn't even make any attempt to to pinpoint what they were talking about if you just read that statement you'd have no idea what they were referring to. So it was so vague that it was like kind of newsworthy how vague it was. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, there was no actual reference to the events that had unfolded that night. And if you were just waking up, like we are in, we are in the UK, and that was the first thing you saw, you'd have no clue whatsoever. There'd been a, a major sort of serious incident after the game there. Hopefully, thankfully, looks like nobody was seriously hurt, by the way, on that note. But yeah, it wasn't. It was ugly. Let's put it that way. It was very ugly. Darwin, Darwin ate a pretty good punch from yeah. a video I saw. So yeah. uh, we'll, we'll see about that. Yeah, he looked okay, like I say, when he was with his kids uh, there after. So hopefully he's fine. But yeah, not pleasant scenes at all. Like I say, the fallout will continue over the day, over the coming days, the weeks. And we'll see and wait and hear about any repercussions, whether it be for the players involved, the fans, the countries, the stadium, the security. It's going to be a really interesting watch. Um, just while I've got you, Kyle, I know you've been right across the USA managerial situation. Obviously, that's changed a time of recording right now. Um. Jurgen Klopp is a name that will not go away in that conversation. I think Tim Howard was the first one to sort of mute it last week at some point, saying he could convince him to take over the job over there. I mean, is this a story that has any legs at all for you? So the two big names that everybody wants here in the US are Pep and, and Klopp. Pep, there's a 0% chance that Pep Guardiola takes his job for a million reasons that I think everybody watching this can sort out themselves. I, I think there's like a one or less than one. There's a non-zero chance that the U.S. hits a home run and lands Jurgen Klopp, but it's so minute. And there's two reasons why. One, um, money. So Greg Berhalter was paid somewhere in the vicinity of two point three million dollars a year. Um, at the 2022 World Cup, the highest paid international manager, Tanzi Flick, with Germany, who made. I think somewhere in the vicinity of six and a half million. Jurgen Klopp, you can correct me if I'm off base here, but from what I understand, made somewhere in the vicinity of $19 million uh, as a, a year as Liverpool manager from what, what I looked up. Mm. So regardless of, of what the U.S. can pay, just from an international scale, he would have to take a massive pay cut from what he's used to. Uh, and then... The U.S. would have to pony up multiples of what they were paying Greg Berhalter, which you add in the wrinkle of the, the fact that they've just made a whole uh, hullabaloo about paying the women's manager the same as the men, which was a big deal. Uh, Emma Hayes is the highest paid women's football manager in the world, and she's paid exactly what Greg Berhalter was paid. If you now turn around and pay Jurgen Klopp 10 or $15 million a year, you've just destroyed that entire thing so there's a lot at play just from a money standpoint the other reason is <clears throat> managers in all sports and coaches say things and then turn their back on those things that they've said within hours uh here in the states there was a a, a college baseball coach who uh after losing the championship game 
uh, like yelled at a reporter for asking him about the rumors of taking another job, like in a press conference, just berated this reporter. And then like 12 hours later, took the job. So that stuff happens all the time. But there's something different about when Jurgen Klopp says, I'm exhausted and I don't want to coach right now, that you just kind of believe. And even if he changes his mind, knowing that international management is way more chill than club management from a day-to-day perspective, it just feels like it would be a middle finger to Liverpool to leave Liverpool because you're exhausted and then turn around and take another job. And given how ingrained he is in Liverpool lore and culture, just it's just different than anybody else in modern football. I just don't see him doing that. No, no. For what it's worth, having spent an hour in the man's company before he left Liverpool um, a few weeks back now, um, I make you absolutely spot on. And I don't see him doing any of those things we just mentioned, really. And I could be absolutely incorrect on that. I don't want to sort of die on that necessary hill. But I think you're right. I think he was definitely exhausted. He wants to spend time with his family. He wants to break. I just don't think the timing's right. If we were having this conversation 12 months down the line, completely different conversation altogether who knows ultimately by that point but right now I don't see it personally and it, it made the money factor is a factor from an American standpoint not from a Klopp one it's more a tiredness and integrity thing and who knows as well Klopp may have sort of clauses he might have sort of handshakes in his agreement with FSG that he won't manage for a certain period of time as well you just never know what behind the scenes on that so yeah and anyway, FSG yeah. would love uh, well sorry FSG I'm sure would love him to be yeah. United States manager at some point but not right now I will say this. If you're Matt Crocker, sporting director of U.S. soccer, Jurgen Klopp is the first five phone calls you make. Yes. Yeah. You, ask there, the you, you, you cross that off the list before you go anywhere else. Yeah. Um, I don't even think you bother with Pep. Like, it's just not a thing. Uh, but you, you, you make Jurgen Klopp lock your phone before you go anywhere else. Yeah, no, I agree. You've got to at least ask the question, haven't you, like you say. Um, Kyle, absolute pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for your time. I'll let you get home safely now. Uh, we'll put your Twitter and your work and stuff like that in the description. Thank you so much once again. Absolute pleasure speaking to you. Everybody else, I'll see and speak to you all again very soon. Take it easy.